and, and intercessory prayer, and there's a seven of them listed there, and one of them is called, uh, and if you have a King James or New King James, it calls it the gift of service or serving. Other translations calls it hospitality. And he talks, and it, the, talks about the, the, the house of God is to be hospitable. And there are certain people that have get different gifts. Uh, and if you are, uh, and the gift of hospitality is a person who, who likes to uh, host. Uh, uh, you like to, to be around people. You like people and people like you. Uh, and you got a happy face. You got enthusiasm. Uh, and so we are, we are, we're developing that ministry. It's an old ministry that's uh, kind of new to us here because we haven't emphasized it. But with, that translates into uh, what we call greeters. As people who stand out there and greet people coming in uh, to church. And um, we need seven volunteers. Uh, all you got to do is to like people, like to love on people, smile, be, be excited about being saved. Now, if you're an old grumpy Christian, don't go out there. <laughs> but, but if you're a happy Christian, there might be something you can do. Uh, yet you're not called to preach, you're not called to the intercessory prayer group, but you're called, but you do like people and uh, let the love of Jesus shine out through you and make people feel welcome, especially first time visitors that need to be welcomed in and come in. So I just want, I'm going, I'd like to meet with everybody that, that would be interested in the uh, minist part in the ministry of, of I'm get my tongue untangled. The uh, Ministry of Hospitality it's, falls into two categories. One is greeters that we're emphasizing. We need seven greeters. We also need about four ushers, men or women. Uh, ushers, greeters are out there greeting people. Ushers work inside here, helping people when we're crowded, find a seat if there's somebody has, uh, uh, needs help. Uh, you, you, if somebody comes in handicapped with a wheelchair, uh, sometimes we have to move a chair out of the way and make room for their wheelchair to park. Uh, help people with handicaps, with walkers and canes and things like that. Uh, but we're just helpers, helping people uh, to be. Uh, and there's also ushers are more into the area of of security too. Uh, so if, if somebody gets unruly in the service, we're, we're, we're right here on the main drag and anybody and everybody goes by here. But once in a while, if somebody is uh, a little uh, high on drugs or, or a little drunk or a lot drunk, I don't know what it is with drunks. They always want to come up here and preach. Uh, and the usher said, you need to be able to head them off at the pass and just tell them, thank you, but pastor's got that under control. And if you'll just sit down here, you'll, he'll help you. Uh, so ushers, but we need ushers that are just are willing to help serve God's people and keep God's people, uh, meet their needs. Visitors come in. They don't know where, where the restrooms are. They don't know. Uh, where they're to send their kids. So those, those are informational things. So anyway, if you're interested in helping in one of those areas, ushering or in greeting, uh, you can be a high school uh, student you can, or college student. You don't have to be old to do this. You can be old. That's a good job for senior citizens. And uh, the Bible says the world is more savvy in how to do things than, than the, uh, the kingdom of God. And when I, if I said the word to you, door greeter, what's the first place that pops into your mind? I know, Walmart. <laughs> and Walmart has figured out that people like to be greeted at the door. Uh, and so uh, we're not copying Walmart. Walmart's copied what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> so anyway, if you're interested in that, Nancy, Pastor Nancy has cooked a meal 
for you. She's back in the kitchen right now getting it ready to serve. And we want to serve you a hot lunch. So you, you can stay if you're with your uh, family. They can stay too. And, uh, but as soon as we dismiss this service, we're going to have a meeting in there. We're going to eat together. And then I'm going to uh, share with you about to, uh, how to, what's expected, how to do what we're going to do, why we do what we do. So uh, anyway, uh, if you're interested in that area of the ministry, uh, come and join me and you get a free meal out of it too. All right. You ready for getting into the word? All right. Who's got your Bible with you today? Amen. Hold your Bible up high. Wave it around, scare the devil a little bit. Look at that devil. Look at all the Bibles in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. So hold it up high. Say, this is my Bible. God's holy word. God's living word. God's powerful word. I believe the word. I have given myself to the word. Jesus is the word. Jesus is in my heart. My heart is ready. My mind is sharp. I will hear the word. I will receive the word. The word will change me. I'll never be the same because the word is changing me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I didn't see any cell phones up. Who has your Bible on your phone? All right, hold it up high. Say, this is my phone. <laughs> it is not on Facebook. It's on my Bible app. I will read it. I will hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And that also means your Bible, your app is, your, your, all of your notifications are turned off. Oh, man. Did you see me get distracted a while ago? I was talking and I heard something over here say, you have mail. And I went, <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> All right. I want to preach to you about a question. It's in the book of uh, Psalms, chapter 116. Psalms 116. We don't have scriptures up on the screen, I see. The... Uh, Psalms 116, verse 12, is a powerful, powerful question uh, asked by King David, who wrote the book of Psalms. David was not only a king, he was a prophet. He, a, lot of prophet a lot of the Psalms are prophetic. He was also, a, most of all, he was a worshiper, and most of the Psalms are worship songs that he wrote. The word psalm means songs. And he, he, was, a, he was a man who worshiped the Lord. Uh, David, he was a warrior. <clears throat> you know, he's the one who killed Goliath and saved the nation of Israel. <clears throat> so look at verse 12. We're in Psalms 116, verse 12. Here's the question. He said, what shall I render to the Lord? And this is the New King James, I think. Uh, by the way, I'm going back to the NIV tomorrow. Nancy's buying, ordered me a new Bible for my birthday. Uh, I don't know why my Bibles keep disappearing. I don't know if somebody uh, thinks my Bible is more anointed than their Bible and they get tempted to steal it uh, or if it's a good luck charm or what. But anyway, I keep losing my Bible and then I lay it down at church and forget it. Uh, so anyway, I'm getting a new one. This one, Nancy ordered it and in gold, it says right here, Dr. Alfred Hall. <laughs> so it, this one here is one I got from my friend Gary Wood. This one says Gary Wood on it. The, uh, but anyway, she's ordered me a new NIV. That's my favorite translation. Uh, but I digress. Okay. And he, he asked the question, let's read it again. Let's read it together. Say, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Everybody say benefits. Let's pray over the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to this time to 
minister the word of God. Lord, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's on the word of God. Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit, the anointing that's on the delivery of the word of God. And Lord, and we just believe you, Father, we're going to deliver the word of God in an understandable way. Lord, in a powerful way, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So what David did, he asked the question and then he answers the, his own question. And so I'm going to talk about what shall I render means give. What shall I give to the Lord for what his benefits toward me? I want you to understand we're going to talk about what we do for God because we're saved. Not in order to be saved. There's nothing that you can do to deserve to go to heaven. There's nothing that you can do. There's no amount of money you can give. There's no much work that you can do to earn your way into heaven. It's a free gift. For God, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish. That perish there means go to hell, but will have eternal life. So, we know we're not talking about earning our way to heaven. We're talking about working for God because we're grateful that he saved us. Amen. We're thankful that he delivered us from all of our bad habits. Aren't you glad you don't have all those old habits anymore? Amen. You couldn't do it by yourself. It was a gift. Freedom and deliverance is a gift that God gave us. We're going to talk about that. So he said, what shall I do? And then he lists us several things that he said, I do to tell God and show God how grateful I am that I have eternal life. I'm so grateful that uh, my destiny is heaven and not hell. I'm so thankful for all the benefits that God has given me that are available to me because I have given my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus paid the price and it's all free for me. So I want us to look at this. Look at verse 13 is the first answer to the question. What, what can I give uh, out of thanks to the Lord? And he mentions all of his benefits toward me. What can I do because of all he's done? He died on the cross for me, forgave my sins, healed my sick bodies, healed, and, and all the things that's ours. So he says, verse 13, number one, I will take up the cup of salvation. I will take up. What is he talking about? What is the cup of salvation? And so I was thinking about that and meditating on that. And so I, I, brought, my, I brought my coffee cup. <laughs> I told you I drink coffee. The, <laughs> so this is a cup. And he says... I will drink, and here he calls it the cup of salvation. So I want you to think of this cup as, as a holy cup, the, God's cup of salvation. Cups come with something to bless us. Cups come with, uh, I start my day with coffee. I had to cut back because... Uh, uh, I started having some blood, high blood pressure. And I read up on it and it said, the first thing you do is cut back on coffee. I said, oh man. But, but I like coffee. I like Folgers coffee. I like that commercial, that little Mexican guy named Juan Valdez. You ever see him on television? Juan is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> And I, uh, we've been friends for a long time. But sometimes cups have other good stuff in it. Sometimes it has cocoa. Sometimes it has tea. Sometimes it, it has, has water. But it's something good. Nothing bad ever comes in a cup. Do you ever notice that? Though, so he, David said, what can I do for God because I'm thankful to be saved. And he said, first of all, I'm going, to, I'm going to take the cup of salvation. So 
Uh, uh, just imagine the word salvation right here. This is the cup. Why does he use a cup as a metaphor or an example of, of our, our salvation? Because people get the idea, mistakenly get the idea that if I just got saved, I got it and I don't have to, I don't, that's, I'm just going to just coast into heaven now. <laughs> And uh, I'm just going to be smooth sailing from here on because I got the cup. Well, listen to me. This cup will not do you anything because there's nothing in it yet. But when God gives you the cup, and he said, David said, I am going to take the cup. A cup sitting on the counter will do nothing for you. A cup sitting on your coffee table will not do anything for you. You have to reach hold. There can be all kinds of good things in here, but until you take hold of the cup and say, this is my cup. This is my salvation. I am going to, part I'm going to participate. He said, I will take the, the cup of salvation. I'm going to get a hold of it. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to make it mine. Uh, I'm going to own it. And I am going to partake of what's in the cup. When the cup. So what's in the cup of salvation? And he calls it benefits in verse 12. There's benefits. So what's in the cup of salvation? Here's what's in this cup. Forgiveness is in this cup. All your sins are forgiven. Forgiveness is in here. Freedom is in this cup. You are free, set free. Who Jesus sets free, the Bible says you are free Indeed, you're really free. You're free from your habit of, of whatever your habit was. You're, or you're still battling with it. That, that deliverance and the freedom is in the cup. There's healing in the cup. The Bible says that he, Jesus had a healing is the children's bread. It's what you give to your children. And you and I are children of God. And so healing is for us. It's in the cup. But you got to get a hold of the cup. You got to sip out of the cup. You got to drink out of the cup uh, to get that healing. You got to get a hold of it. It's my healing. It's my salvation. It's my deliverance. What else is in the cup? Financial blessings are in the cup. Prosperity is in the cup. It's in the cup. Take it out. You, but you got to get a hold of it. People say, it's just like everything else. I want joy. God, give me joy. And God says, it's in the cup. And you sit back here, God, give me joy. God said, it's in the cup. God, give me healing. I'm so sick. Heal me, heal me, heal me. He said, it's in the cup. Drink of the cup. Pick up the cup. Get a hold of the cup. Participate, uh, uh, participate and drink from the fountain of youth. The benefits are in the cup. Let me give you a quick rundown. Flip back to chapter 12. You're in 16. Just look over. I just have to look over on the, the, the company page. And it talks about some of the benefits that are in the cup. He says, uh, uh, when, you are, you're, when you're a child of God, and you fear the Lord, that's verse 1. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. That means respect the Lord and delights greatly in his commandments. Number one, this is in the cup. His children will be mighty on the earth. You're blessing your children when you're a child of God. Salvation includes that. and God put it in the cup. So your children's blessings... Your children will be great. You have a right to expect your children to make you proud. You have the right to expect God to help your children succeed and win the blue ribbons and the trophies and the gold medals. Children are blessed because you are a child of God. It's in the cup. And you can participate out of the cup. I'm so proud of my children I raised, Nancy and I have two sons, and they, they have their children now, and our children, are, our oldest son, his kids are adults now. They all have jobs. Everybody say work. work. Teach your kids to work. 
Teach them to love to work. And quit giving them money every time they whine. The Bible says hunger is the motive for work. Uh, and so just, just let them suffer enough to get a job. Our kids are teenagers, my boys. They, they run around with a crowd of kids that their parents bought them all the latest designer jeans and designer shoes and designer this and designer that. And I'll tell you a, a something. I'm not going to pay $500 for a pair of jeans for my grandkids. They can go to Walmart just like I do. <laughs> they, uh, they may not be as stylish, but, if, but if, ki- if people only like you kids because of your, the, the, the label on your jeans, they're not your friends at all. Well, uh, they, they just love you because you make them feel good to be run around with somebody that... But listen to me. Your children will be blessed. It's in the cup. He said the generation of the upright will be blessed. Verse 3. Wealth and riches will be in his house. Well, it's in the cup. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Righteousness is in the cup. Righteous means that you're free from Guilt and condemnation. You're free from the guilt of the past. Hello? Anybody still here? How many is glad you don't have to carry all that guilt around anymore? That heavy, heavy guilt. When somebody gets mad at you, I know what you did! (laughs) And if if you go to God and say, God, I, I did this, and God said, you did what? I don't remember anything. It's all under the blood of Jesus. You're not guilty anymore. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's in the cup. Accept it. Then he says, your righteousness endures. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Oh, you you don't have to live in the darkness of depression. The darkness of sadness. The darkness of loneliness. The darkness uh, of shame. The darkness of always having to look over your shoulder. No, light is coming into the world because the light is inside of you. Amen. You can walk in the light and not in the darkness. It's in the cup. And then he says, he's gracious and full of compassion and righteous. It's in the cup. Verse 5, a good man deals generously and lends. Whoa, aren't you glad you're related to somebody like that? The the other place he said, "You'll you'll be a lender and not a borrower. Live with your bills all paid and still got money in the bank. Hallelujah. It's in the cup. The blessings... The benefits are in the cup. Okay, go back to chapter 16. What shall I do? He said, number one, I'm going to take up the cup of salvation. And number two, I will call on the name of the Lord. In other words, I will get comfortable with prayer. I will get comfortable with talking to God. I, went to, I was called to the hospital one time when Nancy and I were young and just pastoring our first church. And I got a call to go to the hospital and see a man who was, I didn't know him. He was a relative of somebody in my church. And uh, they wanted me to go by and pray for him. And so I, I went over there and found him in the hospital, went in his room, introduced myself. And uh, I said, I said, uh, your, your relative uh, asked me if I'd come by and, and pray for you. Would you like for me to pray for you? He looked up at me and he said, well, if it'll make you feel better, go ahead. I said, I feel fine. <laughs> Do you want me to pray or not? Well, he said, maybe. And what do you mean maybe? You're sick in a bed right there. Uh, and I said, 
have you ever prayed? And he said, uh, maybe you better talk to him for me. You know him better than I do. <laughs> Some people are uncomfortable praying. I don't know if that's you or not. But one of the things he says, I'm going to do because I'm so thankful to God that he has saved me. Number one, I'm going to pick up my cup and start claiming my blessings. Second of all, I am going to develop a relationship with God where I can talk to him and I can hear him talking to me. God wants to be your father, your daddy that you can talk to anytime, anywhere, about anything. And he's not going to condemn you. He's not going to put you down. He's anxious to talk to you because you're his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. He's honored and blessed that you want to talk to him. So David said, how, how am I going to show my gratitude to God for saving me? I'm going to talk to him. And I'm going to listen to him. It's called prayer. Number three. Next thing he says, he, he said is... It's in verse 14. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. How am I going to thank the Lord? I'm going to be thankful to God because I am going to make God some promises and I'm going to keep my word. There's another scripture. It's over in the book of, I believe it's the book of Ecclesiastes talks about Vows, And he said, you, and, and I'm paraphrasing the Fr Freddie Hall version right here. But what he says there is, people are saying, God, why don't you bless me? It seems like I'm cursed. And God came back and he said, because you don't pay your vows. What a vow is a pledge. A vow is a promise. A vow, not that you do to bargain and negotiate with God, but it's a vow that you make because I love God. I made a vow because I was saved. God, I will always pay my tithes. It hasn't always been easy. But I'm blessed today because I'm a tither. Amen. I'm blessed today. My bills are paid today because Nancy and I pay tithe first. Sometimes we raise money, we make pledges like we've made uh, impact back when impact was going strong. It's going to go strong again, Arsenio. But last time we had, uh, had impact, this congregation raised almost $10,000 to support. And remember those blue envelopes? Remember those pledges we made? Because God said, and if you haven't paid your pledge, if you got carried away, you said, God, oh yeah, I'm going to do it. But then this came up, that came up, something else came up, and it distracted you. I tell you what, yeah, what you do with that. There's two things that you can do about a, a broken vow. Number one is repent. Tell God I'm sorry. Second of all is ask forgiveness and get, ask God to release you from that promise. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God can forgive you of a vow if you made a foolish vow. Your vow went beyond your faith. So if, if you're living with guilt for not paying a pledge, here's what I suggested you do. Number one, let the people that you made the pledge to, like a, an impact case, just come and tell us Boy, I'm so I'm embarrassed. I haven't been able to pay that, and I don't think I go, I don't see how I'm going to pay that. And we'll forgive you. We say, okay, don't pay it. You're still blessed in Jesus' name. But if you just duck your head and look the other way, oh, here, here comes the pastor. No, admit it. We'll forgive it. We'll forgive the debt. God will forgive you. We start over clean next time. And we go from there. Is that fair enough? Amen. But if you paid your pledge, you are blessed. 
Luke 6, 38 kicks in for you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Will God cause people to bless you? You know, God always uses people to bless us. Amen. It's a person who gave you your raise. Jesus. It was a person that hired you to work. It was a person who gave you a gift. It came from God, but God works through people. So, just God says, Luke 6, 38, you need to claim it. So, I will fulfill my vows. That's the best thing because you get the blessing. But if you can't, just ask forgiveness. You won't get any blessing except you get rid of guilt. And then next time, pledge what you can pay. Are you all still here? Amen. Boy, you got so quiet. I was wondering if I was in the right church. Is this the power place or is the church of the first dead? Number whatever it is. Four. He says, I will pay my vows to the Lord. Now. Everybody say now. now. The sooner the better. And he said, second thing, I will do it now in the presence of what? All his people. It's something about doing things together. Something about being a family that we do things together. I like families who do things together. I follow Ar Arsenio, won't mind me using him for a good example. He's a good dad. This guy is, he's on Facebook. Whatever his family does is on Facebook. <laughs> and I, they, he showed so many pictures of Texas on Facebook, and they looked like they were having so much fun. Uh, I thought, man, I should go down there. I wonder if he will adopt me. <laughs> man, they were at the Alamo. They were at the Riverwalk in San Antonio. They were at SeaWorld. They were at the beach. My goodness. But we're glad you guys came home again. Glad you had fun. Give them a good hand clap. Our, city, our youth leader. But what I was point I'm making is, he, all of his pictures has his kids in them. I, get, I never see Rachel. I think she's the one behind the camera. But, but, but they do things together. You hear what I'm saying? They all play sports. When one of them is playing, one of the little kids is playing, they're all there. It's a family thing. We are a family as a church. Are, are you with me? How many knows you ought to know your relatives? If we're in the family of God, we, we're family of members of one another, uh, serving the same God, got the same Holy Ghost, washing the same blood of Jesus, written, our names written in the same book. We are connected through Jesus. You are all looking at me funny today. I don't know. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's the smoke that's out there. That's not a marijuana field burning, is it? The, uh, maybe. <laughs> but listen to me. Spend time with the family. Remember the sermon I preached a couple weeks ago, but let's go to the house. The house of God, the family place. This is our living room. This is our family den right here. This is where the family gets together. Our father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house, to my father's house, to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house, where there's joy, joy, joy. We should sing that, Marilyn. Let's learn that sometime. Family. He said, I will pay my vows now. That's a, key, that's a key in paying a vow. The longer you put it off, the easier it is to forget it. 
The longer you put it off, is the longer, the more time the devil has to talk you out of it. Do it and do it now. Every once in a while, it hasn't happened to us for a long time. But you know, we started this church over 25 years ago, and there's some people in the early days they didn't trust the offering basket. They they tell me sometimes, Pastor, where does that money I put in there? Who gets it? Well, we put it in the bank for the church. It's in the church account. Who counts it? They think they might be stealing it. They don't trust it. So I've had people who will come by my house. I got their offering envelope, one of these offering envelopes, and they come to my house. And they say, I brought my tithes by to give to you. And sometimes I say, why didn't you just put it in the offering? We take the offering every Sunday. Oh, I couldn't wait till Sunday. I might spend it. <laughs> See, that's, that's kind of what David is talking about. He says, I'm going to pay my vows now. It's an urgency. There's a priority to it. It's doing it first. Well, we put important things first on our agenda. Hello. Amen. What do I do, David said, to show God I'm thankful? Number one, I'm going to take up the cup of salvation. Number two, I'm going to pay my vows Number three, I'm going to pray. And number four, I'm going to do, pay my vows right away in the presence of God's people. I think it's good. And I'm glad for people that come to my house and bring their tithes. I'm always happy. But there's something about doing it together. When everybody else is coming up and putting their tithes in, come and go with me. Let's do it together. We get blessed together. When we, we get prayed over, we, are, we all agree with each other. You're getting blessed. Families do things together. And now, number, verse 15, what is this, number 5? Finally, he's, that's, can we go on to verse 15 there, uh, Rod? Thank you. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful saints. When I first read that, I thought, why did he change the subject? I thought we were talking about doing things and paying our vows and doing things because we're thankful for God. I'm going to take up the cup of salvation. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pay my vows. What does this have to do with showing God that I'm thankful? Because he, it looks like this is not something I do, but something God did. Precious in the, in the sight of the Lord <coughs> is the death of his faithful saints. I think the best thing that you can do for yourself for God, for your family, is to be ready to die. I've been preaching, pastoring for over 50 years. I've preached every week for 50 years. I think there's about three exceptions. But I've preached in doing that I preach a lot of funerals. I don't even know how many funerals I have preached. I have I have it kept in a record. Some pastors keep a record. And when I was in Bible college, they told me to start keeping records, but I just never did get in the habit of writing everything down. But it's it's a lot. There's easy funerals and hard funerals. Some of the hardest funerals I know. The hardest funerals there is for a pastor to preach is when, A, you don't know the person that passed, the deceased. You don't know anything about them. Or it's somebody that you know too much about them. <laughs> you know, there's some people... You know, it's a good thing God looks on the heart because all I can see is the outward life. 
And I've been to a lot of places where I hear a preacher preach everybody that dies goes to heaven. All you got to go to heaven is die. And they'll preach you into heaven. Well, when I'm preaching a funeral and I don't know, I tell the family, I tell the congregation, I don't know. God's the judge. And I try to encourage them best I can. But the worst thing that you can do to your family is leave them wondering where you went. Jesus. It's a good funeral when you know where they went. I preached Arsenio's mother's funeral. No, I didn't. I was just, I spoke a little bit. But I was there. We were at the funeral home. And there was sadness, but there was, there was also joy. Because the Bible says we sorrow not like those who have no hope because we have the hope that Jesus is coming back and she's coming back. I could just tell by the expression on everybody's face there and the way they related to each other as it is in Christian funerals. Everybody would say, she's in a better place. I know where she is. She's better off there than here. We cry because we miss her. But we know where she is. That's the most comforting thing you can leave your family. They know where you went. You never leave them guessing. Never left them to speculation. Never left them wondering. They know by your confession of your faith and by the lifestyle you live. And David said, the death of the saints, it's precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints. So I can show my gratitude for God is what he's saying. I can let God know how grateful I am to be saved by being such a light in this world. For my family, for my kids, for my grandkids. That they know where I am when I'm gone. No wondering, no guessing. I know, I know, I know. And God says, see we think that when we're, spe- we're grieving and say, oh, we're crying because our loved one's gone. But you know what? Our tears are tears of grief here. But if God cries, it's tears of joy because he welcomed one of his kids home. And he said, it's so precious in his eyes. You're home, you're home, you're home. So many people we're hearing about now who went to heaven and came back or got close to heaven and came back. We all know the story of Brother Gary Wood who went to heaven. He told his testimony right in this pulpit so many times. And he was so happy in heaven. He, got, he died in an automobile accident in Farmington on what's now 20th Street. Back then it was just a road through there. But he says... When that, his best friend that was escorting him around heaven and showing him heaven, he finally turned to him and said, Gary, you've got to go back. Your sister is there at the accident and she's praying and she's using that name. And God says, you can't stay yet. It's time to go back. He came back. He was here for a lot of years. And then he went. Some people, they said at his funeral, there's a lot of pastors and ministers there and their families, wives, husbands. And people were asking, why did God take Brother Gary? He was still young. He had such an anointing. He's such a blessing. Why? 
And I don't know how many times I heard the answer. Well, it's his second time there. This time he didn't want to come back. I have a cousin, a first cousin, I think I told you about her name, was Juanita. Juanita lives in Missouri. She got COVID. She's the same age as me. She was about two months, she was unconscious on a ventilator. Didn't look like she was going to make it. But all of us, her family, we were praying and believing God with her. And here she woke up. She had to go through a lot of rehab. But she's home now. She still uses a little oxygen. Uh, but she, she, she came all the way from Missouri to our family reunion the other day over here in Utah. And I sat down with her and I asked her some questions. And I said, Juanita, tell me. Were you dead? She said, I don't know. I, and then I asked her, what was it like to be in a coma for two months? Did you know what was going on? No. She said, I hallucinated about a, some things. She had this hallucination that she was, and her, her sister who took care of her told me separately that she was always fight, they, she was fighting the doctor. She was on that ventilator. She kept yanking things loose, and so they had to tie her hands down. And she, she was half conscious and half not. She knew that she was restrained, but she thought she had been kidnapped and was being held against her will, and she was fighting <laughs> All that. But she said, then she got quiet. She said, I saw my mom. She said, I saw her in a distance. She was coming, walking slow toward me. And she never really got to me, but she just got out there a little ways. And she said, Juanita, I'm glad you made the decision to go back. And she said, that's when I woke up. God left the decision up to her. I think Gary Witt had the same decision to make, and he said, I think I want to stay here. But God is looking forward to meeting us. And the best thing anybody can do is to be thankful to God for salvation is to hang on to that cup of salvation tight. Amen. Keep the Amen. cup. Keep a hold on your salvation. Keep a hold on your love for God. Keep a hold on. Never give up. Never turn around. Never, never get discouraged with it. He said, I will get a hold of the cup. And when I get there, God's going to be so happy. <laughs> Ooh, go ahead. Praise the Lord. Let's stand up and pray together. Father, I thank you for the cup of salvation. Everything that's in that cup I get a hold of the cup and I'm going to drink of the waters of salvation. I'm going to drink the, the water of joy. I'm going to sip on the healing. I'm going to drink the blessing and the prosperity. I'm going to, I'm going to partake of the blessing that I leave to my children and my grandchildren. It's all in the cup. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for giving Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thank you. We are thankful. And we're going to work for Jesus till we die. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Praise the Lord. I thought he brought this to show you his coffee cup he drinks out of at home.
That's a lot of coffee. I have a couple of announcements to make. Remember, if you're an usher or a greeter, or want to be an usher or a greeter, I've got dinner ready. Stay and have dinner and visit with us and let Pastor Freddie let you know what's involved in being an usher and a greeter. So stay, don't leave if you want to work in that area. Also, next 